أحمد الله رب العالمين حمد عباده الشاكرين الذاكرين حمدا يوافي نعم الله علينا ويكافئ مزيده وصلاة وسلاما دائمين متلازمين إلى يوم الدين على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع هداه الله أكبر 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 Dear respected brothers and sisters These days are the days of Hajj And the Hajj is an eye opener The Hajj opens the eye of the Muslim on and, and on, on the truth about his relationships it gives him a different view about his relationships whether vertically or horizontally vertically with Allah and horizontally with people and with the surrounding environment Hajj in itself as a ritual has, a lo has lots of symbols and codes and the one who reflects upon these codes who are reflects upon the rituals of Hajj will be able to decode the code of Hajj the Ihram for example the two pieces of white cloth that men wear there and the simple clothes that women wear symbolize the kafan symbolize the two pieces of cloth <coughs> in which people are wrapped in when they die no sleeves and no pockets because people are not going to take their money with them there all the money that you want there cannot be taken with you with your credit card or cash all this is not accepted that the only way that is accepted there is money wire transfer you have to transfer during your life to your account with Allah. And in this kafan, many people think that in Hajj, people wear these simple clothes in order to look poor and weak. It's like we're pretending to be poor and weak, to humble ourselves to Allah. But that's not true. The truth is revealed by the kafan. The kafan reveals that all of us are weak and all of us are poor. After Hajj is over, we start to act. Some of us act like strong people, some of us act like uh, people in authority, some of us act like rich people. But Hajj is not a play in which people act as if they are poor or weak. No, Hajj is the truth and the play is outside Hajj. And this is the importance of Hajj, that people should actually be reflecting upon it. Yeah, but many of us have money. Does this money really belong to us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah An-Nur, وَآتُوهُمْ مِنْ مَالِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي آتَاكُمْ About the slaves, Give them out of the wealth of Allah that he has given you in order so that they can buy their own freedom. So Allah said, give them out of the wealth of Allah, not your wealth. You want to know how much exactly do you own and how much belongs to Allah? Look at yourself entering your grave. The money that you will be taking with you, this is yours. You won't be taking any money. So the money belongs to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The strength that he gave you belongs to Allah. There is nothing personal. It all belongs to Allah. And he gave us this to test us. Standing in, on the Mount of Arafat represents standing in the land of gathering, Ard al-Mahshar, where people will be waiting for the judgment day to start. There, it is so crowded in Arafat and it's also so crowded in Ard al-Mahshar. It's like a rehearsal. <laughs> People are crowded and moving in waves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَرَكْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذِي يَمُوجُ فِي بَعْضٍ 
On that day we shall let them surge against each other like waves and the trumpet will be blown and we shall gather them all together. It's like a rehearsal for the day of judgment. Around sunset, just before sunset, people come out in Arafah out of their tents with their heads lowered down in humility and beg Allah for forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about that day, the judgment day, and all faces will be humbled before the living ever watchful one. Those burdened with evil deeds will despair. Moving from Arafat to Muzdalifah after sunset, millions are moving, millions of pilgrims are moving. It represents and it symbolizes coming out from the graves and moving all together towards the sound that calls them and the summoner who is summoning them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about that day, يَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي الصُّورِ فَتَأْتُونَ أَفْوَاجَ A day when the trumpet will sound and you will come forward in crowds. You see the crowds moving forward from Arafat to Muzdalifah. And then when people finish Hajj, they go back home and wait for the real thing. Wait for their death and then for the judgment day. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. To Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. And on our way to Him, we pass through this life. Some of us fix things up and others mess things up. Umar ibn Khattab entered one day and saw the Prophet وسلم, sleeping on a straw carpet and it left scars in his side, on his sides. So Umar said, Oh Prophet of Allah, why don't you tell us to bring you something more comfortable to lean on? And the Prophet said, Hey, ya Umar, mali wa dunya, hey Umar, what do I need from this life? My example in this life is like a traveler who is traveling in a hot summer day and then he found a tree. He took a nap under the tree for a while and then he continued on his way. This life, this dunya is like that tree under which people take some rest, come for a few minutes, few moments, few days, few years, and then they continue on their way to Allah. This Hajj affects your relationship horizontally with people. In Hajj, all people are united under one flag under one anthem, the flag of La ilaha illallah, and the anthem of Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik la sharika laka Labbaik, here I come, O oh Allah, here I come, here I come, there is no partner for you, here I come. So Hajj unites people, all of us have the same clothes, you can tell who's a millionaire, an owner of a chain of restaurants or a chain of hotels in his country, and who went to Hajj because he got the ticket donated to him? Who's a millionaire and who's poor? You don't know. Hajj changed the life of so many people. It changed the life of Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a convert in the United States who actually joined an organization at that time that had racist views against white people. Maybe because of all of the black people went through in this country, but still, becoming Muslim means that there's no excuse. You cannot be racist. Neither against the blacks nor against the whites. But he was racist. And in Hajj, he changed. And he wrote these beautiful words in a letter that he sent to his loyal assistants in his newly formed Muslim mosque in Harlem, asking them to distribute it to the press announcing his change and there in this letter he wrote during the past 11 days here in the muslim world i have eaten from the same plate and drank from the same cup and slept on the same rug with fellow muslims whom their skin is the whitest of white their eyes are the bluest of blue their hair is the blondest of blonde 
and in their deeds and in their worship, I felt the same sincerity of the black people coming from Sudan, Ghana, and Africa. And then he returned back to the States and he joined mainstream Islam. As a Muslim, one cannot be racist. If you speak to Christians about Christianity, they will probably start by, ask, by telling you about the original sin. What's the original sin? According to Christianity, that Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree. According to Islam, this sin of Adam and Eve is not the first sin ever committed. The first sin ever committed is the sin of Satan. When God Almighty told him, as he told all the creation, and he ordered the angels, and Satan was not an angel, but he was close to the angels. He was a beautiful creature. All of them were ordered to bow down and greet Adam, prostrate for Adam, this VIP creature, new creature, who has superiority in knowledge. All of them did accept him. God blamed him. Why didn't you prostrate yourself to the one that I created with my hands? Satan said, I am better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from clay. I am white and he is black. I am European and he is Arab. I am Arab and he is Indian. So according to Islam, the very first sin is not a fruit that was eaten from a tree. Not an orange, not an apple, but rather it's racism. God said, get out from paradise. You cannot act as a racist here. The verse exactly says, get out from paradise. You cannot act arrogantly here. He wasn't arrogant because he was beautiful. He wasn't arrogant because he was rich. He was arrogant because of his race. So according to Islam, the original sin is racism. And according to Islamic teachings, no one can go to paradise if he's a racist. This is how Islam dealt with the problems of this world. In the States, 150 years ago, they banned slavery. And then what happened? After 100 years, still the blacks were unable to sit on the seats of the whites in buses. Why? Because they dealt with the symptom. Slavery is the symptom. The ailment, the disease is racism. Thinking that slavery in itself is the disease is in itself the problem. The problem comes from the root cause, which is racism. It unites Muslims all together. The same clothes has unites some people. Even the haircut. Those who are coming to Hajj blonde, those had black hair, those had gray hair. After Hajj, no hair. <laughs> Uniting people. In Hajj, people really feel the brotherhood and the sisterhood. The Prophet ﷺ said, A believer is a mirror for his fellow believer. What do you see in the mirror? What do you see in the mirror? No, you don't see yourself. If you want to see yourself, you should keep a picture in your wallet of yourself. And every, one, every time you want to see yourself, get your wallet out, open it, and look at the picture. In the mirror, you see your shortcomings to fix them. You start fixing the shortcomings, and then when the shortcomings that can be fixed are fixed, and only the shortcomings that cannot be fixed stay, you leave. A believer is a mirror for his fellow believer. He shows him his shortcomings. He advises him. Horizontally, also gives you a new view or about your relationship with the surrounding environment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqtulu sayda wa antum hurum. O you who believe, do not kill game while you are in a state of consecration for pilgrimage. When you are wearing your ihram and you are still in a state of ihram, you cannot go hunting. Peacefulness with the environment. This is good news for vegetarians, by the way. But you can still eat what you slaughtered before Ihram. And, and, Mecca in itself is the first natural 
sanctuary because it's not allowed to cut the trees in Mecca. So in Hajj, people have a different experience of peacefulness. And then when they go back home, they should spread the culture of peace among people and with the environment. These days are the days of Ibrahim. The first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. I call them the days of Ibrahim. All those pilgrims that went around 3 millions every single year, through all the years, through ages, went to Hajj as a response to the call of Ibrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرِي يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ Proclaim the pilgrimage, he's telling Ibrahim, proclaim the pilgrimage to all people. They will come to you on foot and on every kind of swift mount, emerging from every deep mountain pass. So Ibrahim called, O oh people, God has built a house, so visit it and come as pilgrims. So all of us go responding to the call of Ibrahim after he was ordered by Allah to call people to come to Hajj. Slaughtering sheep or camels or cows in, uh, in the day of Eid is a commemoration of Ibrahim's submission to Allah. He was ordered to do something very strange. Allah doesn't, call pe doesn't tell people to slaughter their kids, but he told him to slaughter his kid. And his kid submitted. And he submitted, and then Allah replaced him with a huge uh, uh, sheep. So slaughtering in Eid is commemoration of the submission of Ibrahim and the submission of Ismail. It's amazing. He took his baby because he was ordered by Allah, and he threw him and his mother in the desert where there's no water. They will definitely die except by the grace of Allah. After he became young and strong, Allah told him to go back and to his kid and kill him. So the kid never saw him. And when he grew up with his mom, but she raised him as a Muslim. And he knows that his father is a prophet. He told him, I'm coming to kill you. And the kid submitted. He said, do that, dad. If Allah ordered you, then do that. SubhanAllah. Throwing pebbles in Hajj is a commemoration of the, uh, of Ibrahim, of actually the obedience of Ibrahim to Allah. Shaitan came and tried to convince Ibrahim not to do that. Are you crazy? Are you going to kill your son? And Ibrahim kept stoning the Shaitan. So when people stone the Shaitan, it's a commemoration of Ibrahim's submission. When people in Hajj walk between Safa and Marwa to and fro, they are commemorating the trust of Lady Hajar that she put in Allah. She put her trust in Allah. She trusted Allah. And she kept walking between Safa and Marwa in this desert, trying to find water. And then the water gushed from under the feet of her own baby. Islam is the only religion in the world which is not called after someone. Did you realize that? Did you ever think about that? It's not named after a human being. It's not named after a group of people it's, or a tribe. It's not named after a geographic region. Hinduism after Hind, India, a geographic region. Buddhism after Buddha, a human being. Um, Christianity after Jesus Christ, a human being. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Judaism after Judas, the tribe of Judas, a group of people. Islam is after who? It's not after Prophet Muhammad. Who named us Muslims? Parents name their children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ هُوَ سَمَّاكُمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِ you have the faith of your father, Ibrahim. He has called you Muslims. So the one who named us Muslims is our father, Ibrahim. So there is a relationship of parenthood between us and this beautiful prophet, the father of the prophets. 
and as an ummah we should take him as an example like we take prophet muhammad as an example on individ individually we take prophet muhammad as an example as an ummah we take ibrahim as an example how can an umma, a group of people, take an individual as an example? Well, Ibrahim was not an individual. Give me five minutes. Ibrahim was not an individual. Ibrahim was an umma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Ibrahim kana umma. Ibrahim was a whole nation by himself. Allah made us remember him five times every day during our prayers at the last tashahud. When we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim, wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim. Allah made us remember him in our morning of car and evening of car. When we say, asbahna ala fitrat al-Islam, wa kalimat al-Ikhlas, wa ala deen nabiyina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala millati abiyina Ibrahim, hanifan wa makana min al-mushrikeen. He's a role model to the ummah. He was chosen and this ummah was chosen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ هُوَ جِتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ Allah says, strive hard for God as is his due. He has chosen you. So Allah talks to this ummah and says that he has chosen this ummah to carry the message. And also Allah says, إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ كَانَ أُمَّةً قَانِتًا لِلَّهِ حَنِيفًا وَلَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ شَاكِرًا لِأَنْعُمِهِ اجْتَبَاهُ وَهَدَاهُ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Allah says, he was thankful for the blessings of God who chose him and guided him to a straight path. There's a lot of commonalities between us and Ibrahim. His enemies tried to burn him alive in fire. قَالُوا حَرِّقُوهُ وَانْصُرُوا آلِهَتَكُمْ they said, burn him and give victory to your gods. And us, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Qabidu ala sayati zamanun ala ummati yakunu al-Qabidu ala deeni kal-Qabidu ala al-Jamr. The Prophet said, the time will come when the one holding tight to his religion feels like he is holding a hot burning coal. Yes, religious people today are grilled. Are grilled by non-religious people or by Islamophobes grilled by their tongues sarcasm about religious people making fun of them and tyrants shoot them down and burn their corpses like well cc these things happen to religious people you have to understand that so this is the commonality between us and ibrahim but ibrahim was not affected by the fire allah ordered the fire to be peaceful and cool on ibrahim and when we have the Iman of Ibrahim, Allah will give us victory also, insha'Allah. Ibrahim wanted stronger Iman. And this verse is a misconception about Ibrahim, by the way. Allah says, and remember when Ibrahim said to his Lord, Oh my Lord, show me how you quicken the dead, how you bring the dead back to life. And his Lord said, Don't you believe yet? He said, no, I believe it's just to strengthen my faith, to strengthen my heart. And people say, so Ibrahim's Iman was not that strong, was not the maximum. There is no maximum for Iman. Ibrahim understood it, that there is no maximum for faith. You can always have more faith every day than the day before. Ibrahim destroyed the idols and we have to destroy the idols. Which idols? Our idols. Every one of us has an idol deep inside of him that he worships. And this idol is, I am. The ego. The ego that destroys, can destroy anyone. The, de the ego that destroyed shaitan himself. What destroyed shaitan? Was there a shaitan before the shaitan that made the shaitan become shaitan? There wasn't. What destroyed him? I am better than him if you feel yourself better than the others then you really need to destroy this idol Ibrahim debated against the tyrant and we have to debate the tyrants we need to speak out loud against tyrants أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول وأفوض أمري إلى الله أو الله do not condemn us if we forget or fall into error 
Oh Allah, do not lay on us a burden like that which you did lay on those before us. Oh Allah, do not lay on us a burden greater than we have the strength to bear. Oh Allah, forgive us. Erase our sins from our records. Oh Allah, you are our protector. Grant us victory over the evildoers and over ourselves. Oh Allah, grant us what you promised us through your messengers. Oh Allah, save us from the shame of the Day of Judgment. Oh Allah, save the Muslim blood. Oh Allah, save the Muslim souls. Oh Allah, save the Muslim children. Oh Allah, whoever plans to do good for the Muslims, help him and bless his deeds. Oh Allah, whoever plans to do harm for the Muslims, make his plans return on him and make his destruction in his own plots. Oh Allah, grant us your love and the love of whom you love and the love of every deed that gets us closer to your love. Oh Allah, we seek your protection from anxiety and sorrow. We seek your protection from helplessness and laziness. We seek your protection from cowardice and miserliness. We seek your protection from the burden of death and the tyranny of man. We seek your protection from disbelief and poverty. We seek your protection from the punishment in the grave. Allahumma hdina wa hdibina wa jalna sababan wa sabina liman ihtada. Iftah baynana wa bayna qawmina bil haqi wa anta khayru al fatihin. Iftah alayna barakatin min al samai wa abid anna al harama wa riba. Baid baynana wa bayna al harama wa riba kama baid baynana المشرق والمغرب اللهم إنا نسألك حبك وحب من يحبك وحب عمل يقربنا إلى حبك الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد for the next three days إن شاء الله you need to be doing takbir all the time جزاكم الله خيرا and بارك الله فيكم